Um, well, uh, first of all, hopefully people can. I'm not sure if people can hear. Hopefully everyone can hear me in one way or another. Is there any way to even test that? Okay. So you have people can chat. People can chat with you, right? Or actually, I can see their chat also. Yeah, we can we can try that. Although I may be able to see them too. So uh, if uh, anyone is tuning in, this is Matt Blumberg, and Rusty and I have been having some uh, technical challenges here. Um, so hopefully, if you're on the Hangout, you can hear either me or her, or both of us, preferably. Um, if you're uh, able to send in a quick comment to, to uh, on the chat, let us know if you can hear me or Rusty say something so we see if they can hear you. Sure. Um, all right. So Rusty's question is, what is the best way to com uh, to communicate a vision to uh, to your team? And um, I, you know, there I have a few thoughts about that. The first one is that you can never do it enough. Um, no matter how many times you communicate your vision to your team, um, don't assume that that work is done because the words have come out of your mouth. People need to hear that um, over and over again in a very consistent, uh, very consistent way. Um, to get the message, to internalize it, and to, to make sure that they're um, kind of on point and on track for it. Um, I, you know, I always feel like anything around vision, strategy, planning is, uh, is best done when it's some mixture of top-down and bottom-up. And um, you know you you can't develop strategy by committee effectively, and you can't develop um, uh, you can't develop a vision by committee, but you can get your team to buy into it um, by helping you articulate it or helping you shape it on the margin. Uh, so the you know the times in our company's life where we've done. Um, any kind of strategy or planning or visioning exercise, I've always tried to involve as many people as possible, either in collecting data for it, uh, in editing it, in brainstorming around it, uh, so that um, people have a much greater sense of where it's coming from and and um, uh, you know and therefore sort of what that what the end product is. They kind of feel bought in from the beginning. So I, I don't think there's any one particular format that. Um, you know that works better than others for sharing it. Um, I think you know one one of the formats that's particularly popular at the moment uh, is the uh, sort of lean canvas um, kind of nine box um, format for um, talking about a business and the hypotheses you're trying to test and where you expect the revenue to come from, what you expect the value proposition to be, um, and that's a that's a you know a, a handy format because it sort of breaks down. The vision into you know into nine essential components or eight essential components, um, but uh, but that that's one of many formats that that you can use to communicate uh, sort of high level direction for the business. And they they can't see you, but they can hear me. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, and how do we want people to send questions in by by typing them in? Okay. So um, we are uh, we are having technical difficulties. Um, I am I am both on a phone call with Rusty and on the Hangout, uh, so I can relay uh, things to the group that she says, or uh, or she can relay things to me. Um, so I'm happy to answer any question that people have on any topic, uh, and uh, the best way to get it to me is to put it in on the group chat, and uh, I should be able to see that myself. If not, Rusty can relay it to me on the phone. Um, uh, 
sorry, so you have a you have a core team, however many people are working with you in the early days. How do you think about developing each person? Um, so with a small team, yeah, I think the um, uh, the the, the first thing about it is recognize if you if you re recognize that each person needs development and that each person's development is different, you're way ahead of the game. <laughs> you're way way ahead of where um, most uh, uh, startup CEOs are. Um, I, you know, I would say the um, uh, the the process of collecting feedback about people from the organization, adding your own feedback and um, and thoughts and judgment to it. And then uh, over time, um, trying to figure out how um, someone's performance and how someone's uh, behaviors line up with the job you're asking them to do and the job you think that uh, they'll be um, evolving into in the future. And also getting input from them about where they see their career in the future and what they want to do. All of those are the, uh, are the sort of inputs to creating a, a development plan. And um, we, you know, typically create development plans for employees once a year. Uh, for senior people, maybe it's a little less often. Maybe it's every year and a half. In the early stage of a, of a business, you, there's no right or wrong for, for the cadence for it. Annual tends to be the easiest thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, I would say it's equally incumbent on you as a leader and the um, uh, and your colleague as an employee to work on the development plan. If anything, it's more incumbent on the employee to own his or her own uh, own development plan and make sure that they're seeking out skill building opportunities or stretch projects or experiences to grow um, as a professional. Um, I think the look. I'm a huge believer in um, employee development and in self development, and um, and I have believed in that from the beginning of the company. I would say if you're starting a business today. It's not something you need to worry about for a few months. Hopefully, you're pulling people in to be co-founders when you're in that kind of entrepreneurial soup, where um, you're pulling them in because of what they're good at today and what they're passionate about today. Um, but if you're really going to have a successful long-term um, enterprise that grows over time, that adds other employees, where you're changing the dynamics and the mix of things, then uh, absolutely, you need to um, make sure that you're focused on sort of feedback and development of all employees. Um, but uh, I think the most important thing is there's no, no such thing as one size fits all, and marrying feedback, uh, 360 degree feedback about someone with their own future aspirations, with your own needs uh, for running the business, is the right formula for coming up with a development plan. Sure. So the question is, what's my uh, point of view about stock options, and um, do I believe in issuing them to the whole firm versus some employees, and how much uh, of the company's stock uh, do we reserve for that, or should you think about reserving for that? Um, you know, my uh, uh, point of view has always been to give everybody some level of stock options and to give more and more of them over time, either as people vest, uh, as you promote them, or as they do a great job. Um, I think uh, I think that varies a little bit by industry, and I try not to get caught up um, in thinking that everything is like technology. It is certainly the norm in technology companies and, and internet startups, software startups, to give equity to all employees. And um, it is not the norm in other industries like retail. So understanding what your prospective employee population is thinking about and, and expecting from an equity perspective is probably the most important thing. You can deviate from expectations, but you need to note that you're deviating from expectations. So if you're starting a software or technology company and not planning on issuing equity, that's fine. You need to make up for it in some other way, probably through um, greater than market cash compensation. The reason that I've always believed in, and, and the reverse is true. If you start a retail business where no one's used to getting equity and you give people little bits of equity, um, it could be a very powerful thing and it could mean that you have to do some other benefit less than the norm. Um, you have to think about equity as part of the total compensation package. Um, I feel like the benefit of um, the benefit to the organization of giving people equity is that 
uh, people are owners, and you can talk to them like owners and treat them like owners and expect that they will behave like owners, uh, that they'll spend the money's company as if it's their own, that they'll spend their time um, uh, in ways that most benefit the organization. That's kind of the theory about um, equity compensation. Um, the other theory about it is that it's long term because it vests over time, uh, and um, you know it it can be a cash cheap way of compensating people. In terms of uh, sort of percent of the company that you'd want to think about reserving for equity, um, I think the um, the typical number that companies sort of shoot for is twenty percent. Um, I've seen somewhere it's higher and somewhere it's lower, but that's probably a good uh, kind of general rule of thumb. And um, as uh, if you're in the kind of business that raises money and dilutes uh, the um, overall cap table over time, um, adding to the equity pool over time to keep it around, uh, you know, sort of 17, 20, 22 percent um, is uh, is pretty commonplace. Ah, okay. Absolutely. It's a very common problem uh, in startups that managers, CEOs, leaders um, don't have time for it, don't want to make time for it, um, think that it's not um, a driver of the business, and uh, think that it's a waste of time. You absolutely run into that. I still run into that um, uh, you know, at, at our organization, too, which is you know, 420 people now. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, if that's an important thing to you, uh, and you're the CEO and you're setting the tone and the culture, um, you uh, need to make sure that it is known. That's an important thing to the enterprise. It's not negotiable. Um, tell people when you're interviewing them and hiring them. Uh, and you know, ultimately, if you have uh, if you have a senior manager that doesn't fit with any of your rule set or value system for governing the organization, you probably don't want them in the organization. It sounds like a dumb thing to say, wow, you know, you should fire your head of uh, whatever, your head of engineering, because he doesn't believe in developing his people. Um, but if your organization has made a commitment to employees that you will develop them, um, then you need to do that for everybody, not just for people who work in departments where the head of that department wants to, wants to do it. I'm, I'm never a believer in compromising on quality of team. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think it's sort of a false choice to say, well, either I can have good people or I can stay on schedule. Because if you have mediocre people, then you're staying on schedule with what? With a product that's not going to work well at the end of the day. Um, so if you're having trouble attracting talent, um, focus on the root cause and figure out how to attract better talent. Maybe you're not paying enough. Maybe you don't have an exciting enough story. Um, you know, maybe you don't have a good enough team to attract people to work with. Um, and uh, you know, there are always, when it comes to development in particular, there are always ways of, of outsourcing uh, bits and pieces of development or whole modules of development, whether it's offshore or uh, you know, there are plenty of good development shops uh, in the US as well. So, uh, you know, I would err on the side of supplementing um, in-house with um, with outsource rather than saying, "Well, we'll just go with the B team and push them hard." Yeah, hire slow and fire fast is always the mantra. For me, and um, you know, it's better to have a, a an open job than a job filled by someone who's not going to do a great job. Um, I think most things you can do don't require a lot of money, um, so it doesn't matter if you're bootstrapped or um, you know if you're venture financed or debt financed or or anything else. Um, I think the uh, the easiest ways to develop staff are um, through content and coaching, and there are 
tons of great resources in the content arena for developing people, uh, whether those resources are uh, business books or blogs or Harvard Business Review articles or TED Talks online. Um, and you know, your, your job and the, the place where you have to spend the most time is curating and figuring out um, you know, sort of what, what materials are going to be most relevant for the people involved and for your organization. And then you're the teacher. You're the coach. You have to use those materials and, um, and coach people to them. And um, you know, we, from, from very early on here um, at my company, uh, you know, I've had a, um, you know, sort of a, liter a business literature canon that I've um, shaped over the years and added to over the years. And um, you know, I give people books constantly here. I send around Harvard Business Review articles and blog posts constantly here. Um, and then you have to create the time and the space to discuss them with people as well. So that's, I mean, that's the that's the low budget way of uh, of doing it. Um, you, there are ways to spend an enormous amount of money on outsourced training and coaching and development, but um, if you don't have it, you don't have it. So the question is, uh, what is the best way to deal with someone's disappointment about not getting promoted uh, for a job? And um, you know, I, I think the um, probably the the most important thing is to kind of manage the process well up front, so people aren't totally surprised. Um, you know, if someone raises their hand for another job, or if you're looking for a marketing director and you have a couple marketing managers, you probably have, you know, 90% correct instinct in your head up front as to whether or not the person will get the job. And uh, I always believe in, in you know, just being as honest as possible with people up front. If someone says, hey, you know, I, I want X job and I think I'm entitled to it or I think I'd be great for it, um, and you don't agree with that, there's no reason to say, oh, well, yeah, sure, throw your hat in the ring and we'll see how it goes. You know, much better to say, um, happy to have you throw your hat in the ring, but I'm not sure it's a great fit and, you know, look at data as opposed to opinion, right? Here are the things that I'm looking for in this role. Uh, do you feel like you line up with that? So managing someone's expectations on the front end are probably the most important part about managing their disappointment on the back end because it minimizes disappointment in the first place. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately when, when someone is competitive for, um, you know, for a promotion and you don't give it to them, um, you know, I think the, the, the best thing you can do is you know, have a have a heart to heart with them. Probably not in the office. Um, explain to them why you made the decision you made. Um, affirm that they're still a valuable member of the team, and uh, talk to them about what is next for them. What do you see as next for them, or what skills you think they need to work on in order to take the next step in their career? So you know, you can turn that negative news into a coaching moment and a development moment. Not, not that I can, not that I can, but I have to imagine they're out there and you can find them. Um, you know, I always say the easiest way to, to figure out the right investors for a company are to look at the websites of other companies that are bigger than you in your space uh, and uh, try to figure out who's funded them, either by looking at um, uh, any number of kind of publicly available sources of, uh, of venture financing, um, or just look at the about the company website, or look at press releases they've issued in the past, and figure out who's funded them. So there definitely are some. I, I have a friend who started a raw food company, and he had venture investors. I can't remember who they are off the top of my head, though. So the question is, how important is it, and how difficult is it for the CEO to um, elicit uh, feedback? From the organization, and my answer to this is is unambiguous that it is um, it's critical to do that if you're going to act on it, and it's the worst thing in the world to ask for feedback if you're not going to act on it. So I, you know the formula I have around feedback is you know it's kind of four parts. Um, it's ask for it, it's accept it gracefully, gracefully being the key word. Uh, and that means you're accepting it without, uh, you know, offering 
uh, defense and without defensive body language like a scowl on your face and crossed arms. Uh, so ask for it, accept it gracefully, um, uh, act on it, and ask how you're doing against it, and repeat the cycle as necessary. Um, I think uh, that uh, you know CEOs who do that are the ones who want to improve and who uh, want to be making sure that they're meeting the needs of their team. Um, but you do have to be prepared to act on the feedback. You don't necessarily have to act on every word uh, that everyone says, but um, you have to be prepared to aggregate the feedback and ask for clarity on things and prioritize it and uh, and show that you care about it and show that uh, the feedback is meaningful to you. Otherwise, no one will give it to you a second time. Um, um, Performance improvement plans, I think, for, for them to... Oh, sorry, sorry. The, que the, the question is, when someone's not performing, how do you design a good performance plan for them? Um, so, did I get all of it resting? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think good performance plans uh, have to have a couple of things. One thing they have to have is a concrete time frame. And the other thing they have to have is uh, concrete milestones or metrics. Uh, now, not every job lends itself to metrics, but Every job does lend itself to metrics or milestones. And those are really the ingredients you have to look at. Because at the end of the day, what you want for a performance plan is you want the data to make the decision for you. So if you have a sales rep who's underperforming, and uh, you want to put them on a performance plan, uh, and, and you and the rep agree that good performance at your company means selling 10 widgets a month, and you say, if you do not sell 10 widgets a month within one month or two months or three months, then you are not meeting our standard, um, and the rep sells four widgets, then the decision's made. You've taken it out of your judgment. Uh, so concrete timing and concrete metrics and milestones. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Is that okay? So not necessarily a, a team getting feedback on itself as a team, but just startups. How, what's the best way for startups to gather feedback um, about individual performance? Probably, um, you know, it kind of depends on on the culture that you have. Uh, there are lots and lots of um, systems uh, in the world that are geared to collect. Um, anonymous, uh, either quantitative or qualitative feedback. You can also use Google Forms or SurveyMonkey or Google Docs or anything else um, to you know to do that work as well. Um, I certainly have had a great experience here over the years, uh, particularly for more senior people, in um, in getting feedback not uh, anonymously through a system but um, collected by a facilitator in conversations. And those conversations can be one-on-one -on -one interviews, or the method we prefer here is to do group conversations. So when I'm getting my review, my direct reports sit in a room together with my board and a facilitator and have a conversation about me where people have homework, so they come in with strengths and development opportunities and critical incidents. Uh, and uh, the conversation is is guided by a professional facilitator, and people, uh, you know, are taking notes on it, uh, and um, the feedback's collected that way. But you can certainly do it in in um, any kind of uh, either HR system or you know, sort of open collaboration system. Yes. <laughs> I guess it, you know, it, that's a that's an interesting one. I don't I don't quite know how to answer that. Probably is the answer. Uh, half of an A player is better than a than a B player. Depends on the job. There's some jobs where you can't have a part-time person. Um, you know, you actually need someone there all the time. Um, and then I would say it's better to wait for the A player than to have the B player. But um, you know, there there are plenty of things where you can use a part-time person or a contractor and. 
you know, frequently half of a great person is more uh, more output than all of a not great person. Uh, you know, life is full of ebbs and flows, and uh, you know it's it's pretty easy to burn a team out by uh, just having your foot on the accelerator uh, with no reprieve at all. And people are capable of working much more than they think they can for much longer periods than they think they can when they believe in the mission and when they are well motivated to do that. But you still can't do it all the time, or you burn people out. And there's a, a real cost to the business in. Um, churning through employees, and you have to factor that in around uh, how much productivity you're expecting to get out of teams. So there's nothing wrong with asking people to dig deep and work harder, um, but you can't do it indefinitely. Yeah, so uh, we are about out of time. Thank you all very much for showing uh, up today, and uh, Rusty and I apologize for uh, the technical difficulties. Uh, she looks great today. I'm sorry you can't all see her, uh, but uh, I hope everything is uh, going well for all of you who are participating in the class. Bye-bye.